and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Welcome to this in-between episode. Because I'm taking a month off, I thought I would at least give you something to watch while I work on the next series. What I decided to do was to throw together some of my Patreon videos, and this will give you something to keep you going, and also give you a taste of the type of thing that I do on my Patreon channel, which has, at the time of writing this, over 60 videos. Bear in mind that these were created for my Patreon channel, and as such, some of them are not scripted. Also, I don't think my supporters will mind if I take some of the early videos and show them to you, and at least it will give you some idea of what I'm offering. Because the Spectrum Show magazine eats up so many game reviews, I often find myself trawling through the archives to pad them out a bit. And it's during these trawls that I find some truly terrible games, so I thought I'd share them with you. Because I don't own these games, they won't be in the show, probably, but I can play them here just for you. The name of this little section really says it all. I can't believe the companies actually released these games. How could anyone look at these and say, ooh, that's really good, that's going to get to number one? I obviously steer clear of the usual suspects here, like Crazy Kong from SeaTech and Squidge from Powerhouse, and some of these games here you've probably never heard of. Well, maybe apart from the last one. Game on then, and the first is Antarctic Diamonds, released in 1985 by Twentysoft. <laughs> From what I can gather, the aim is to collect the diamonds and avoid the enemies. Oh, this is so bad. The graphics move well enough and the sounds okay, but the game is just, well... Repetitive, dull, boring. And this is the best of the bunch. Prepare yourself. Next we have Hampton's Court, released in 1984 by B-Side Software. This is a maze game. You have to get out of a maze. And you have a set time limit to do it. Is that it? Really? Move faster! The whole thing stutters around. And this is the entirety of the game. There's no enemies, nothing to collect, nothing to kill, nothing to do but wander about this crap maze forever. Do you like mazes in real life? Does anyone like mazes in real life apart from the Victorians? Are you a Victorian? Time for the next one then. This is Buzz Off by Electric Software, released in 1984. The idea is to eat fruit. What the hell just happened there? Why did I die? What's going on? What's this? Oh dear. Do bees eat fruit? Are there any bees that big? Why is there a spider here? What the hell is going on? If you have any ideas, write them on the back of a postcard and send them to someone who gives a toss because I don't. Is this really a game? I mean, nothing really happens apart from your bee getting killed every few seconds. Right, on to the last game, and no crap games compilation would be complete without a game by CRL. This is Grand National, released by CRL in 1983, and this is totally different to the other crap game released by the other crap company, also called Grand National. Let's get on then. This is a gambling game, a game of randomness, so that always means absolutely no playability. On the hardest level, 
if you can call it that, you get to name the horses and set their odds. Ooh, that's exciting. Look at that silly smiling man. He's wearing lipstick and has a hat that's too small for his head. I'm going to bet 50 quid on a 20 to 1 outsider. Maybe when we get to the race it'll get better. No, no, I was wrong. Little stick horses move along at a snail's pace, watched by little stick men, stick women, stick children, and yes, a stick dog. They're so excited they've all died and turned into mummies. Not one of them is moving. It all moves so slow. Well, I think to bear you any more torture, let's skip to the end and see who wins. Ah, oh, it wasn't me then. Oh well, never mind. Shall we try again? Uh, no. That was it. The end. There was some dross released on the spectrum, and in a way that's why I like it. Imagine a PS4 or Xbox One game being released like this. Oh, no, sorry. That would never happen, would it? You can only get FPS games and football games now. Oh well, time for a glass of wine. Thanks for watching. There's always one thing that appears in these junk boxes over and over again. The Home Computer Course and the follow-up Home Computer Advanced Course magazines. Running from 1983 to 84 for the original and then the Advanced Course took over from 84 to 85. I've always shunned away from these. Having flicked through a few issues initially, they appeared boring and aimed at the younger audience. However, a fan of the show donated a stack of these and said if I wanted I could just throw them away. Having them for free at least gave me a chance to examine them in more detail, at my leisure, and the content quite surprised me. I may do a longer feature on these marvellous, often shunned publications, but for now, I just want to share my enthusiasm for what I've found so far. Yes, there's a lot of dross in these pages, a lot of dross, but every now and again, you get the gems. Just look at these diagrams, they're brilliant. This one shows the microdrive. This style of drawing and illustration is found in many issues. And here's one that explains a printer. And this one showing a tape player. And this one a trackball. I mean, they're just superb. Photographs too were always of a very high quality. And here's one showing various add-ons for the Spectrum. It wasn't just things about the Spectrum I enjoyed. Now this is one brilliant computer room. And this, this is my favourite at the moment. And this is how the future of computing will look. There's a keypad to enter binary, because all programmers will want these. Discs will shrink to be smaller than the 3 inch, currently available. There'll be an infrared mouse and you'll be able to view everything on a room-wide projection system. Is that an iPad down there? Hmm, interesting. CD-ROM will replace ROM cartridges. Well, at least they got that bit right. And just look at that wonderful image. Some images, though, are best left alone. But this is the fun of this magazine. You never know what will turn up. Uh, yeah, let's move on. This cover intrigued me. Notice the fake dirt on this man's face, but the real dirt on this man's trainers. Obviously cheap models, and they seem totally oblivious as to what they're supposed to be doing. They don't even seem to really care. I will continue to read these, and I've got about a hundred to go through, but I'm enjoying every page turn. Thanks for watching.
This time we're going to look at Spectral Panic that was released in 1983 by Houston Consultants Limited. It was a 16k game, so it would run the 16 or the 48k Spectrum. And it's quite special for me because I got my Spectrum in the Christmas of 1983, as I've said many times before, and I got Spectral Panic and Attic Attack. And Spectral Panic was the game I played most. Attic Attack was a bit too big and hard and complex for me um, all the way back in 1983. It's, it's, I, I wouldn't have, having played it for a, um, for this feature, I, I wouldn't have considered it to be a sort of high score challenge type game. It's more a survival game, isn't it, than, than anything. It's it's not like a typical game where you try and rack up a lot of scores. Well, from my, my opinion, anyway. It is, but survival is the name of the game. But while you're surviving, you you rack up a score. My technique in the game was always to try and block off a bit of the the area, as it were. It's a single screen game, and it's a usual panic thing. You have you have ladders and the uh, monsters chasing you. You can you can dig holes and they drop into it, and you fill it in, and they drop down. And of course, you may or may know that it's it's based on the arcade game called Space Panic, which was released in 1980. And it's quite, an, it's quite a nice little game. It's very colourful. I, I wasn't expecting that sort of game with that sort of graphics for that sort of era in, in arcades. But the first thing I noticed after I'd been playing it, and then you sent me your recording, is that you play the game totally different to how I did. So how did you play the game? At first, well, the, the main reason I played differently is I didn't realise you could sort of herd the, whatever they are, the aliens, by only part building holes, by part digging holes, so that when they approach them, they then bounce back and don't get that way. So you sort of, you block off areas to stop them moving, and then you sit in wait for them to come and drop down the hole that you've created. Yep. Whereas I, I didn't realise you could do that, so obviously I was running around a lot, digging holes, up and down ladders, and digging full holes in different platforms, and then running back to try and um, kill them at the same time. See, I, I didn't realise there was that, that strategy behind it. Well, I think what happened is, when I started playing it, the way I first started to score points was just collecting the, you know, there's the gems that you collect that keep your time going. Yeah, that, that's another element as well that I didn't realise. I just thought it was one of the, sort of, just run around and kill everything. I didn't realise there, there was a timer ticking down, and to keep that going, you had to collect, um, what, are they, what are they supposed to be? I think the gems or something like that. I, I mean, there's kind of one that's kind of gem sh stone shaped, and then there's another that's a heart shape. Yeah. Of a food. Yeah. Actually, I think in the instructions it says they're food. Right. Okay. Like I said, I was running around like crazy trying to kill as many as I could, but not realizing that you could actually control their movement. Yeah. So, what did you think of it when you started playing? My very first impressions were. This is a typical 16K game for the early 80s. It's got very basic graphics. There's no animation in the aliens. And the little man moves quite okay. But it, it felt like just a quick pick up and play, knock together, souped up typing game. That was my initial impressions. Hmm. After playing for about five or six attempts and then trying out different strategies, it got quite addictive actually. Once you knew that you, you could dig the holes and you could pretty much not predict the patterns, because that's one of the things I liked about the game, is that the aliens don't just home in on you, like a lot of the early stuff. Mm. They actually move randomly. There was a little bit of strategy involved in that you had to collect the gems to keep your health up, and you had to keep an eye on the movement patterns of all the other aliens so that they didn't corner you in. Obviously, I'm, again, I'm speaking a bit before I knew the fact that you could actually stop them doing that, stop them surrounding you. Yeah. I mean, it's. I I think it's one of the games that if you come to it now, you're gonna you might get into it. I guess you played it a bit more because you knew we were doing this feature. Yes. Um, but it it it's strange. It's one of those ones that for for me, I I played it a lot back in the day, and as I said, I had high score challenges with my dad. And at first, I think we just picked up the gems. Then we started digging holes and doing exactly as you said, dig them almost randomly, and then. Uh, try and kill the aliens that way and then i think we worked out the tactic that you dig the potholes and use that to herd the aliens as you say it and get yourself a safe area yeah and one of the things it throws at you the game throws at you is that when you get to a certain score all the holes open up so then you've got to refill in some of the ones that you've dug before to keep your herding strategy going is it when you get to a certain score or is it when you've killed so many aliens do you know what the trigger is it's when you get to a certain score Right, okay. 
The only thing I, I really hated about it was the key layout, and, and I thought that was terrible. It's, it what, it, what is it? W for up and X for down, A for left and D for right. Yep. And K for dig and O for fill, and they're okay, but the, the movement is really awkward, even on a real spectrum, because I was playing it on the 48K spectrum to, to take some footage. Yeah. The, I think, well, I mean, on the real spectrum, this is, is as bad as anything else. I, I was playing it on my uh, 128K for this and, and trying to use that configuration. And you find that uh, probably my fingers are getting older now, but you find after a few games, you think, I'm going to, my, my left hand is going to be permanently made into a claw. That's <laughs> awful. I, I mean, and there's, um, from what I can see, there's no joystick option either. There's not. Um, I, I think that that really lets it down. I I like the old-fashioned, simple games as well. That's why I think I go back to the Spectrum so much. They weren't horrible and complex. I mean, this would this would have been brilliant with a two-button joystick. That would have been perfect. Yeah. In episode 80 of the show, I promised a long look at the Best of PCW compilation that featured a multitude of typing games sold as retail with a rather nice box. Well, here it is. It's time to get annoyed, frustrated and infuriated with some classic typing games. Moving through in order, the first one is Patience. As the name suggests, it's a version of the card game of the same name. This 48k typing replicates the usual view when playing this game, but the input is rather annoying in that you have to enter the column to move from and then the column to move to. If the move is accepted, the card will be redrawn in the right place. The game is made slightly harder because there is no colour on the cards, so you have to work out what the suit is by looking at the badly drawn symbol. You can deal from the pack by pressing D, and the game plays the usual way, albeit in silence, and with not much in the way of excitement. Moving on. Next is Sheepdog Trial. I covered this in the show. You move your dog around and force the sheep to move. Then using your excellent sheep herding skills, you have to round them up and get them into the pen at the bottom of the screen. Not a bad game for a typing, really, as I said in the show, and something different. If you complete the first one, there's another harder level revealed. Ooh, the excitement. The graphics are character-based and the sound is limited to beeps and the control is often unresponsive, as you'd expect from basic games. Next we have Quadrangle. You have to place counters on the board to form a square. You can play against the computer or another human. As you can see, this is a simple Connect 4 game. And the Spectrum takes ages to think about its move. Yep, this is certainly exciting. Moving on, next is Virus. Yes, this is a standard, but very poor light cycles game. You control the white bits and have to block in the yellow bits, which in case you were wondering, is the virus in question. The response to key presses makes this game tricky, and very annoying. As the game moves on, you get more and more opponents, which does add a little bit of interest I suppose, but it's nothing special. Next we have planets. OK, this is not a game. It's a simulation of the four inner planets and their path. Hmm. I covered this in the show and there wasn't much to say about it then either. Let's move on. Next we have target practice. This is a two-play game, so I'll have to improvise. OK. Mm -hmm. A rocket moves across a red screen. Yes, a red screen. Player 1 presses the A to fire, and player 2 presses L to fire, and you have to hit the hash marks. Hardly original, is it? And only a farting sound when you hit something. Mm. This could be a long night. Next we have show jumping. Oh joy. You guide your little hat to the flashing S first, to start. And then you head for the fences in order that they flash. When you get to a fence, it is drawn in close-up, and you have to enter a number. The number represents the width and height, 
So for a full width, full height fence, you enter 9. And for the smallest one, you enter 1. However, this is very tricky to guess. And it's very rare that I actually got over a fence. Nope, failed again. Do I want to retire? Yes, please. Next we have cheese. Again, I covered this in the show. You control a cat and have to intercept a mouse as it makes its way towards the cheese at the centre of the screen. Control is terrible, and it's sometimes tricky to get into position. If the mouse hits the cheese, it eats a bit, and once it's all gone, it's game over. Well, this is exciting. Next we have Go Muck You. Yep, a simple version of the board game. Get five pieces in a row to win. What? Three minutes to set up? What the hell is going on? <laughs> this is ridiculous. I bet the game's crap when it starts anyway. Oh bloody hell. First it's quiet and now it's annoying. Here it is then, the long-awaited game. Yeah. How long is this going to take? I think we'll move on now. Battleships, anyone? I think we all know what this is going to be. Ha! It crashed. Brilliant. Let's try again. Nope. Okay, let's have a look at the program, see if we can fix it. Line 440. Checking the listing, that flash command should be a then command. Okay, let's do that. Right, let's try again. Ah, success. I've got to place all my ships, and there's a lot of them. Hmm, at least I get a submarine or two. Okay, let's try and blow some stuff up. Missed. Missed. <laughs> Okay. Yes, this is dull, isn't it? Well, I think this is the end of side one. We've got side two to come. But for now, I think we need to um, go sit down in a quiet room with a glass of alcohol. Thanks for watching, and I'll be back soon with side two. The next game is 3D Tanks, probably one of the most famous DKtronics games. Anybody who hasn't played this needs to play it. And uh, let's start by mentioning this is a 16K game. I don't know if you can see that on the inlet, but it's 16K game. So let's have a go at this. Put that there so you can see what we're playing. Let's have a drink. Cheers, everyone. Lots of options. Um, I think I just kind of remember what the controls are. Probably not. Maybe I needed to look at the controls before I started playing. Otherwise, I'm just going to get. Oh, okay. I for info, that should tell me. F and T, left and right. S and W, F and T. Um, and fire is Y. Okay, and space abandons the game. Not what we want to do, really, is it? Right. Okay. Okay, 
so anyone who's not played the game before, you have var various elevations on the gun, as you can see. And you have to get them right so that they hit the tanks. Whichever row they're on. Missed. Okay. That's going to take that one out, so I'm not going to get that one. That goes there. So yeah, you have to gauge where your shell is going to land based on the enemy tank position and the elevation of your gun. You can hit the tank two ways. You can take it out completely by hitting it right on the turret. Like that. Or you can disable it um, by hitting it in the tracks. Which I'll try and do. Uh, and disabling it in the tracks, like, oh, that's hit it right on again, okay. Disabling it in the tracks will stop other tanks from getting across, but still allows the tank to fire. Uh, as you can see, if you get too many tanks queued up, one of the tanks can in fact shoot back like that one's going to there obviously the the further away the tanks are the longer it takes for the shot to get to them I'm not going to get that one now yes so if I go up one I should be able to take the turret out now this is a really good game, I really enjoy this. Um, it's challenging, especially with the elevations. Sound effects are good, graphics are good. Sound effects are good, everything is good about the game, apart from the, the layout of the keys, which are somewhat tricky. So anyway, that was 3D Tanks. Uh, if you've never played this game, you're missing out. It's really a challenging game. You have to dodge their fire. It, yes, it's really a challenging game and great fun. It's good time to spend uh, good to spend a few minutes or hours on, depending on. Right, I've never run out of ammo, and I think you get ammo. Uh, at regular intervals, um, which is, I've now got to sit and wait and just dodge the incoming fire. Anyway, that was 3D Tanks, really good game, and definitely worth playing. Cheers. Well, I think that's enough for you to be going on with. I hope to see you soon in the next series, which is well underway. See you soon, and don't forget to check out my Patreon videos.